Why did it do that? Hey, everyone. <laughs> hey, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I had my microphone muted because I... We're waiting for it to show up for us, so we're live. But we're live now, so cool story. So Chris is over there dying, laughing to himself. So I re we're getting comments. People are like, there's no audio. What are you guys talking about? Okay. Well, that's a good way to start off. So, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And excited to get underway here with today's webinar, talking about, of course, church websites. And I'm sure many of you guys are still recouping from the Easter weekend. Uh, we've been praying for everyone, hoping that you guys had an awesome Easter weekend. Hope you guys had a great turnout at your church and uh, ultimately a better turnout for just people who are excited for the kingdom. So, uh, as we get started, really going to be getting into a uh, discussion with things that are about optimizing your website specifically. Uh, we're going to talk about the newest features from Share Faith Church websites to show you guys a bit more about that so you get a better understanding of how those work and what those can do to potentially make things a lot faster for you as you're looking to uh, put together more pages on your site in the future. So uh, before we begin, though, I do want to pray. So let's do that. Father God, I thank you for this time today. I thank you for uh, just the opportunity to come together, uh, just as stewards, Lord, uh, who are looking to use the resources and the tools that are given to us to uh, maximize the potential with which we can reach others, Lord, that the gospel can be spread and that others can come to know you. And so I ask that that would be at the forefront of our thoughts and our minds, the goals of what we're looking to do today, um, that that would be uh, the purpose that we strive for, Lord. So we thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, for those of you who uh, have not been to a Share Faith Academy webinar before, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Zach Merritt, and I have the Mr. Chris Reed on hand uh, on chat with you guys. So he's the one, if you look down underneath the video, who's chatting away. And if you have not used the chat down below, you can do so simply just by putting in your name. Or if you'd like to, you can connect with Twitter or Facebook. It does not post anything to Twitter or Facebook for you. It's simply using the avatar and name from that. Uh, so it's totally up to you which way you'd prefer, but it's great if you want to chat with us just to kind of give us more feedback about what you are wanting to learn more about as we get through this webinar. If there's anything that jumps out to you um, that perhaps you would like uh, further detail on later, uh, we will have some Q&A time at the end. And I'm going to be talking into a lot of kind of more behind the scenes subjects and some things that um, you may not have really explored or researched yourself before, and that's why I'm here to help you guys do that, um, but also just to try to give you a better understanding of ways that you can use uh, all these resources and make things uh, faster on your site, as well as boost search engine rankings uh, for your site so you can show up quicker on sites like Google and Bing. So we'll go ahead and get into this. I'm going to switch over so you guys can see my screen, and that's uh, taking up the video feed for you. All right, so you guys should see my screen now, and uh, it says church websites optimization. Take your website further, and a little thing says do more right there on the screen. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look into how we can do more for the website. So uh, first things first, I want to talk a bit about things that will affect your site's speed. We're going to get into this topic first, and then I'll turn around and show you guys some stuff on the church websites, including the new features. So... Uh, the first object of which uh, is really one of the bigger things that affects your site speed, uh, provides one of the more significant impacts, is all related to your server and coding. Now this is stuff as a ShareFaith member, for those of you joining us today who are already members of ShareFaith, you don't necessarily need to worry about because we handle all of these things in the background for you. So there's not much really that uh, can be done here that you would really make a big impact because we're already handling that stuff on our side. But for those who are perhaps self-hosting their websites, um, if you're in that camp, then these are things that you would need to worry about. Uh, and there are ways that you can go and actually research how your server and your code uh, on your site all make an impact and how fast it loads. Now, why are load times so important? Before we move on to the next thing, I want to talk about that real quick. Load times are very important because, uh, number one, of course, if you come to a website and it's taking forever to load, that turns you off from it. You probably... You know, I mean, we're so impatient these days. We just want to, you know, go, go, go. So if we go into a website and it's taking forever for an image to load or something like that, uh, we might, you know, just blow off the whole thing and say, never mind, I'm moving on. So websites, uh, your loaded time is very important, especially if you're homepage in areas like that where people are going to come first. Um, and also it looks a lot cleaner, too, if it happens to load all together rather than you having, like, these sections that are taking their own time to load. So I'm going to talk a lot about that and how you can help that side of things. 
Um, but apart from that, it also actually affects your search engine ranking, if you didn't know that. Uh, by having faster load times, uh, sites like Google and Bing take preference, uh, give some preference to those sites. So having faster load times can be a big impact there as well. So as I said, this first thing, server and code related stuff. Again, if you're already a member with ShareFaith, you don't need to worry about that side of things. We take care of that for you. And then the next area, really the side that's more in your control and the areas that can still be a major impact that uh, really we see as probably one of the biggest impacts for our members' websites is how you place your content and what specifications you do so. Um, so if you're not the developer, the things that you can control are in your website's content. And I'm going to give you uh, the three biggest, I guess you would say, notorious uh, ones that are uh, going to affect your load speed. And, uh, or as I call them on this slide, the perps, the perpetrators. Your first one is going to be your images. And so with images, there's so much to discuss here. And so I'm going to say I have kind of like the main point right there. Images uh, should be under any circumstance on a website. There's never a reason to have it larger than 4,000 by 4,000. And JPEG format is good because it's universally seen. Uh, PNG is also another one. JPEG I would recommend more usually because typically it's a smaller file size. Now that dimension that I give you, 4,000 by 4,000, I want to stress this. That is like the absolute maximum size that you probably never even need to go to. And this is a thing that we see a lot on church websites, unfortunately, where somebody goes, they've got a nice camera that has like a million megapixels to it, and they just take pictures and they upload it straight to their church's website. So you've got this great, you're like, oh, this is such an amazing, crisp, clear picture. Sure, fantastic. Uh, but then the picture is like 25 megabytes in size, and it takes forever to load because it's this massive file on your page. So I want to let you know, like, first of all, your resolution will have some impact on that by making it smaller, and it will depend on how you're using it. Uh, now, a 4,000 by 4,000 JPEG, like, when would you ever need something this size? Well, like I said, you probably never would because this is even bigger than a 4K image. Like, in a 4K image, you might set as a background if you have a lot of people that you're thinking of out there that might be looking at your website on a 4K monitor, which, just for reference, there are not many of those people. So you're probably never really going to need to use a full 4K image as a background. Um, now, what I would recommend if you're going to be setting an image as a background size is more like 1080p HD, 1920 by 1080. So that's a fourth of the size, uh, roughly, of what you're, what you're seeing on me list here. And most of the time, even that's bigger than what you're typically using images for. But if you have some, an image that's that size and you have it compressed for the web, notice how I say on the end there, compress images beforehand, that makes a huge difference. Now, how can you compress for the web? There's a couple different ways that you can do it. Um, when you are creating the image, let's say you use a program like Photoshop. Photoshop actually has an option called Save for Web. You can look into this to see where it's at, and it'll actually give you an idea of how big the file size is going to be after it does it. And that does things to adjust like your DPI ratings. Um, DPI is something that we're familiar of with like for printing. Like you've probably heard of terms like 150 DPI, 300 DPI when you need to print out your bulletins or your flyers or stuff. You do not need that high of DPI for the web. 72 DPI is typically what's recommended. Now that, that might be something that you're really not familiar with and I don't you don't know where to go to fix that. That's okay. If you're in that camp, no problem because there are services out there you can get you can look at like uh, tiny JPEG is one website that you can upload an image to and it'll compress it so it keeps it down to a lower file size. Another one is called Kraken.io and I'm going to send you guys some notes after this too with some of this information so you don't have to worry about it if you can't remember it exactly from this webinar. I might recommend taking some of your own notes for anything that you really uh, want to have uh, a good memory of and then by tomorrow you'll get an email from me that has uh, just a recap with some of these more finer details. So anyways, with images, uh, like I'm saying, you want to compress them beforehand. There's never a circumstance they should be over 4,000 by 4,000 resolution. Uh, there's just not a, I mean, re monitors these days are just not 
uh, big enough. Like you've got m maybe some 5K monitors that Apple's put out there. And again, it's just you have a very, very, very small audience that will be using something that size. So that's just a reference on images and how you can do that to keep images small because images, when they're loading up, they make the, they take the rest of the page forever to load up. Now, Shareface does do some things with images. Like if you put an image, say, in a, a three-column layout and you've got a much smaller area that it's going in, we actually have it set so it will reset size itself to fit there. The problem is that your website still has to load the entire file before it resizes it. So it doesn't actually make your site faster. Um, we just do that for aesthetic reasons and that's how we can help you to make sure it stays put in the right size. But if you need to make that uh, any if you need to make that you know smaller yourself, then you can just go in and actually make the image smaller before you upload it. Best best strategy always. So like something like on a three column layout, you probably never need to go more than like 500 by 500. And you can tinker with it and explore and see like what works best for the way that you're using it. Because there's so many different ways that you might be using an image that I, I'm not thinking of. Um, but you can play with it and kind of see how much difference it makes in putting something that size. But you're going to get a significantly smaller file size and it's still going to display at the full resolution that it needs to for people to see it. All right, so that's that's images. And again, if there are any questions you guys have about that stuff coming up, uh, then just be sure to chat with Chris in there, and he's going to keep on all that stuff together so that towards the end of the webinar, as we have time, I'll make sure to answer those for you live. So, okay, so images. The next one, audio. All right, so audio. This is an area that uh, is we have a lot of customers who come to us and say, um, that they're uploading especially their sermon audio files and it's very easy to make an, a massive sermon audio file because one thing that we notice a lot of people will do is they just go and record at the highest settings possible. Um, there's nothing wrong with like making an initial recording a super high quality recording. I'm not going to discourage you from doing that, but as far as when it comes to putting it on your website, you're going to need to make some major conversions uh, so that way it's actually appropriate for the web. So as you can see, my recommendations that I have here, sermon audio recordings should be 48 to 64, 64 be the maximum I would suggest, and that's actually what iTunes lists as their recommended podcast settings, is 64 kilobits per second. So there, I, would not, I would never go over 64 kilobits per second for your sermon audio feed, and mono, not stereo. Why? Well, you don't need a left and right channel when somebody is doing a sermon. When you're doing a voice recording like that, you don't really need a left and right channel experience for your users. Also, it's going to half the, si the file size. So if you have a 50 megabyte file, it's going to turn it into 25 just by putting it in mono because you just have the one channel that comes through both speakers. So definitely recommend doing it that way. And we actually have tutorials on, sh on support.sharefaith.com that talk about how you can convert your audio file sizes beforehand. And we have a link to a place where you can actually use it as an online converter right in the tutorial. Okay. So, and Chris was just telling me too, like on that tutorial, if you go to support.sharefaith.com after this to go find out how to do that, he's included a link uh, in the tutorial itself that goes to an online converter. So it'll show you how to do it and take you where you need to go to do those steps. So these kinds of things can be major changes to help reduce the file sizes that are going on your computer. Because when somebody comes to the page that has your audio on it and they go to load it up, I mean, again, it's using their internet connection to have to load up that entire file size and buffer it as it's playing through the player. So making those smaller is a big convenience for your users, and it's also going to be a lot less taxing on the servers for your website. And then uh, lastly, as I mentioned, as you can see, I've made a little note there, make sure too that you're saving in an MP3 format. MP3 is very universal, and it's something that's recognized not just by your website, uh, but also if you submit your feed to iTunes uh, or any other RSS reader, they'll be able to read those as well, so people can subscribe to podcasts and all of that cool stuff too. All right, and so now uh, the last, and you probably see a pattern here with these three. They're all media items. The last one, of course, being video. So this is something that we, again, we've talked with many customers about, and uh, one of the things we recommend is to not host the video on your own website. 
Um, the servers are not really designed as a video hosting server, so it does move a lot slower than if you were to host through services like YouTube or Vimeo or any of those. Um, and if you do those, then you can just simply embed the video onto your page from YouTube or Vimeo. Um, I like with YouTube, especially if you're doing a lot of sermons, you can actually embed an entire playlist uh, so you can put all of your sermons into a playlist on your YouTube channel and then embed the playlist itself onto your website so that way people can easily access them all from within your site. Um, so they don't have to go to YouTube or anything like that to watch them. Now, uh, a word of caution with embedding and uh, also relation to the last thing I just said. So it's nice if you embed the playlist because it has a single video load at a time and they have a list to choose from of the other videos. If you try and embed individual videos on a page. And I've actually seen seen this done before where a church goes and they actually just go and embed their entire sermon video archive channel from YouTube, just place all of the videos individually on the page. Um, not only would that cause like a massive page that people have to scroll through, but it would actually, uh, in many cases, crash someone's computer because we had an incident where somebody posted like 60 videos, I think it was, onto a single page. And the thing is, your computer has to load all of those videos. Its graphics card is working overtime to load each of those individual videos. So not just your internet connection, but your, your hardware itself will be totally just hammered by this if you have all of these videos just one after the other like this. So I would say never to post more than, mm, I mean, it's, it's based on how your layout is, but I, I wouldn't do more than two or three videos to a page under most circumstances. Um, so, and it just depends on how they're being used. And really, in most cases, you only see like maybe one video on a page, and then there'll be like a list of others to choose from that they can watch. Um, so it's just kind of being uh, conscientious of that as you're laying out how your videos are going to look on your page and how you want to make them available. Of course, the ShareFaith, uh, on the ShareFaith Church websites, the sermon player, uh, you can include a link to the video wherever it's from YouTube or Vimeo, and then there will be an, an icon that is clickable on the sermon player where they can watch the video on there, and it just pulls it up in a new window for them, uh, versus having to load all of the videos at once on that page. So those are all things to be mindful of, and again, that is going to significantly increase the load time and response time on your site uh, just by taking these three things into consideration. Okay, so again, if you've got any questions on that, I want you to let Chris know about that because we're going to come back at the end and I'll just make sure I answer anything like that that might be coming up. Uh, in the meantime, though, I just want to make sure we have enough time to cover the rest because I still have, I really still have a ton of things that I'm going to share with you guys today that I've been researching on. Um, the first thing, though, I want to show you guys who are curious to know how the new features work or what those are entailing. So I'm going to switch gears here and move on over to a website for us. So. Here we have uh, here we have a website that's set up right now. This is just using one of the ShareFaith templates. And I have it open to the content tab in Sidekick. Now this is where you'll find uh, the new features uh, that we've included. So that we've, we've done uh, three major new things that will help to really speed up the process as far as building uh, new pages on your site. Um, one of the biggest requests that we were getting from people a lot was essentially uh, how can I replicate the content and the layout of the template that I'm using uh, with the website. So somebody, uh, especially for those of you, you come and you find a design, a, a website template that ShareFaith offers that has a, a nice design and layout that you want to work with. Um, we understand it can definitely be a drag when you are then creating new pages and having trouble kind of moving that content or copying that content over or getting that design again. So what we've done is under the content tab now, uh, you'll notice whenever you click add new page, there is a new window that appears that gives you the option to choose uh, essentially from all of the unique layouts that we've done off of the main pages uh, from the church website templates. So if you see, uh, for example, you want to create a new about page um, and you want it to replicate the look and feel of the original about page for this template. Um, so this will look different for each template based on how it's laid out and what it has. But then you can go in and I'll, I'll click a, uh, well, first thing I'll do is actually I'll, I'll create a page title. So I'm going to call this one staff. We'll do that. And then I'm going to go ahead and click the about page, which in this template already has staff photos. So that's convenient. 
and then right away it generates uh, a blueprint for me. And so this is what we call page blueprints. So it has all of the original, excuse me, all of the original content uh, that was provided with that template. And then this just takes a little while to load, but it will actually, uh, it will also generate uh, image placeholders uh, for each area where an image was. So anytime there's like a media originally on the page uh, or some type of code, it'll give you a placeholder for it so you can go in and then be able to do your own uh, once it's loaded up here. So uh, as you can see though, it gives me all the rows, everything that was laid out for this one is here. So I can then go in and make any changes I want to. So if I want to, uh, like let's say I want to keep the the term leadership team for this one and simply you know make a, a short statement here just saying like our staff in leadership at Ridgepoint Church are excited to welcome you to our next weekly meeting. I'll, I'll just put that for now. And as you can see now, the image placeholders are loaded as I was working on that. So I can go in here and if I click on one of those, it'll then give me the option to go into my media library and I can go track down uh, some images that I'd like to use for my staff pictures. So I'll find one of the ones here, if I still have them uploaded. Or I can just choose any image for example. So then uh, it'll even actually give me the option here to crop and resize the image to the same dimensions as the placeholder was. So it just really takes a lot of the guesswork out here for you. And I can move this around if I need to, uh, to be able to get it to do what I want, rotate it as I see fit. So once I'm finished, then just pops it right into that spot for me. So of course you would take this, take your own photos and be able to do that. And this actually is resized to 300 by 300. Uh, so it's creating a new image from the copy that I had. And so you can just likewise do this with the whole process. Now let's say I want to add another set of rows, like maybe I have another uh, section of staff that I want to add. Well now we've added the ability to where you can actually duplicate a row, an entire row, with all the same content. So if I hover over here you'll notice we've added this new button that says duplicate row. So if I click on that, then voila! it gives me an exact duplicate of the row that I clicked on. So now I can go in and do likewise to be able to create more. Now that's cool for being able to uh, you know, create new pages, uh, like if I want to use the, uh, the original design of my template, and if I want to uh, replicate content within a page itself that's really fast and easy. So I can save this then. And once I've saved it, it now appears in the menu down here. Um, but let's say, for example, I've already got a page. Um, we'll go to the women's ministry page, one I was on earlier. And let's say I actually, um, maybe I've made changes to this or this is just not in my blueprints list, um, but I want to create a new page that actually resembles the way this one looks. So then what I can do is find it in my content area, so women's ministry right here, and you'll see there's now a duplicate page icon for this as well. So if I click on that, then it'll give me the option to uh, provide a new title. So let's say I want to make a uh, seniors, senior ministry. So then I'll save that. And then now that it's saved, it's going to show up to where uh, this is essentially a duplicate now that I can work with. So I can say, uh, let's see. I can put whatever I'd like here for however I want to title it. Um, you know, make any changes that I want to. I can take out that. So once I'm done, I'll just go ahead and save this page. And again, it's gone ahead and created the new senior ministry page for me here. So now this is under additional pages since it's, it doesn't know where I want it to go in my menu yet. And then I can just click and drag this on up uh, underneath these other ministries if I want to and then apply my changes, but now it's showing up in my menu. So very easy to make brand new pages this way without having to start all from scratch. And if you want to, you can definitely start from scratch still. You can go to add new page, and then let's say I want to make a uh, fundraiser page or whatever I like to call it, and I can just choose to do a blank page, and then that'll give me a blank canvas to work on, so I can do whatever I want from here. So 
it's just another way where we're not taking away any freedom from what you already had before, but we've added in some new, quicker, easier methods to be able to generate all new pages and content within seconds. So it's a super easy way that I know a lot of people have been asking about for a long time, and we're excited that we now have that for you. And so now, and as I was talking before, you guys have a better understanding too with your media and your content, how you can do things to make things faster with your load time. So again, if any questions are about this, don't hesitate to let Chris know. I see he's typing with some people right now. And then at the end, we'll go through and cover stuff together as well. Uh, but I, I do have even more information I want to share with you guys. There's lots of stuff we're covering this webinar. And again, as I said, I will follow up with some more notes for you. So you'll have some more detailed notes that I'll give you guys after this. But I'm going to go ahead and go back to my presentation because the next thing that I want to talk about Oops. I just want to minimize this. Next thing that I want to talk about. Oops. Going back to the. Is search engine optimization. Okay, so this is a biggie. Obviously, one of the things with a website that you probably get asked about right away, uh, especially in early stages of development, is how do we make sure that we show up on the first page of Google? Okay, well that's that sometimes can be a tall order, but thankfully, because you're really only looking to uh, have local searches, people who are in your area looking for churches in their area, that's kind of your key demographic as far as new people. And then of course you'll have others who already go to your church who will probably have more detailed ways of searching. Um, so there are different things like that that you wanna make sure that you're being found under searches for. Well, so there's lots of different things you can do to help your search engine optimization out. Um, you don't have to do all of these things, but I'm giving you uh, just a list of things that are very easy for churches to do um, that will make big uh, that will make big improvements into your search engine ranking. So the first thing I'm going to suggest, uh, again, your focus is local SEO. Right, so you're, you want to use services, and if you haven't used these before, I want to recommend you look into these things. There's Google My Business, and there's Bing Places, and essentially these are business directories that Google and Bing host. And if you were to place your information, uh, verify your information through these services, the nice thing is when somebody is on these uh, search engines, uh, especially like on Google, you'll, if you've used Google before, I'm sure most of you have, if not all of you, then you go on and you'll notice when you're looking for a local business, it'll pop up with things like you'll see um, things like the, the business hours, uh, it might have links to uh, the website, a phone number to call. This is how they do that, by putting their information in Google my business. So likewise, churches can do the same thing. You can put in the information about your service times at your church. Um, you can put in the uh, phone number that you can be reached at and of course a link to your website uh, so people can go to that as well. Um, and then uh, in addition to this, it'll also verify your address information. So it'll pull it up. So if somebody's doing a more general search of their location, um, like they're typing in the city and like churches in such and such city, uh, then you'll have better chances of being shown of showing up uh, in those early directory listings that have the map and then the pinpointed areas of showing where each church is at. So this is a definitely, a, I would say, a must for every church to go in and do something like this. The verification process is pretty simple. Uh, I've gone through it with my church, and essentially once you go through the steps and you can just, you can just go search Google My Business to see where to go to start this process. Um, and likewise with Bing Places, do the same. And then uh, from there, I know with Google at least, they'll go through and just ask all the information, get the details from you. And then to verify your address, you'll be mailed uh, something from them that does that. Uh, if that's not available, if you have a different mailing address or something, then you can go and uh, once they've done their process, they have another option where you can do so by phone, I believe it is. So definitely something to look into and how you can do that if you haven't already done so with your church. The next thing is make sure you're taking time to do some keyword research. Now I can say that people are searching in your area, uh, such and you know churches in such and such city, but that keyword may not be correct. Um, I'm just throwing that out there as a suggestion and maybe a starting point to go look at. One thing you can do is start typing uh, some general keywords like you can type in your city name and then start typing in churches right afterwards to see how quickly it comes up in suggested searches in Google. 
Um, likewise, you could do the inverse, where you start off with saying churches in such and such city. And the order does matter, because depending on what people actually search more for, that's what you want to try and nail down so you understand what you want to put as your focus keywords and key terms on your site for Google to pick up on. Um, and so that's a, that's obviously just a, a hit and miss way. Like you're just kind of thinking to yourself, like what could it be? There are keyword research tools out there that you can gain access to, um, but they are typically paid services. Um, there's ones out there like Google has one called Keyword Planner, and you have to have a Google AdWords account in order to use. Um, that's something that I haven't been able to determine fully yet whether or not Google offers that with their Google uh, nonprofits uh, uh, system. So you can look into that and see if that might be a possibility. Uh, otherwise, you can research it and see what the cost might look like if you were to jump to something like that. Typically, though, I'm going to say you, mo you most likely don't need to go that crazy with keyword research. Uh, mainly, just try to use common sense. Think of, like, what do you search for when you're looking for businesses or places in your area? Um, what possibilities, what other possibilities could there be that you think people might search for uh, for businesses in your area? And just kind of go off that. But again, like doing some searches in Google, in Bing, in those areas will help you kind of see what they're coming up with for suggested searches as you're typing things out. And that can help you get a better idea of what you're looking for. Another thing, and this is, uh, this is Google specific, but Google likes Google. And this is actually something where people have found uh, through doing tests and stuff where you will notice a jump in your search engine results over the other guys if you're embedding Google services onto your website. Uh, like, for example, we talked about YouTube videos. Using YouTube over Vimeo has actually proven to, in some cases, improve your search engine result ranking. Uh, by doing something as simple as that. Um, embedding a Google map onto your contact page helps Google to understand that that's your contact page, that's where you would find information like contact details and address and that sort of thing. And also it just shows them that you're using their services and they like that too. So that can give you a boost as well. Um, so anytime you're using a Google service on your website, Google's going to give you some preference for that because they uh, are very, um, they, they, like, they like it when they see that kind of stuff. Another thing, and this has been brought up in webinars past and stuff, but I'm going to tell you again, if you're looking to help yourself in SEO, seriously consider operating a blog on your church website. Um, there's a few benefits to this. Obviously, with blogs, you have fresh new content that Google can index regularly. If you're doing like a weekly or bi-weekly blog um, on your church website or even a monthly blog, that's just something where there's new content coming through on a regular basis that they can pull in. Um, the other thing is that it it can be another way to engage users. So if somebody comes across an article on your site and they're sitting there reading the article, the longer they engage with it, the better that looks to Google. Engagement time is a huge thing. And for that, I'm going to tell you this. When you blog, don't just go for the bare minimum. Like a 300-word blog is like, that's okay to show up on Google's radar. Um, but like, go for a long blog article. Um, by doing a longer article, obviously you have people who will be reading longer if they're going to be actually reading the whole thing. Um, but also there's more information there that Google can index. And uh, uh, this is just a little bonus thing with it. I've heard of some bloggers who will say this. They don't. There are some bloggers who blog every day, and they put something out all the time, and that's great. Uh, for the, There are others I know of who put out longer articles on a less frequent basis, and then what they do is they'll take snippets from that article. So they'll take like a quote or a uh, reference from that article and they'll tweet that. They'll post it to Facebook. They'll make a mention of it on social media. So if you're looking to do some things with social media as well, um, blogging is a great way to give you some some information to work with there where you can actually pull some tidbits out of it. Um, maybe you want to put like a, uh, you could even put like a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a transcript of your last week's sermon um, from your pastor. Uh, that could be a nice big blog article in a sense on there that Google can index and you can put you can put little tweets and, and uh, Facebook posts and stuff like that from that as well onto your church social media. So those are ideas to think about uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about the idea of what to blog and how to blog on your church's website and how that can impact your search engine results. 
All right. And then another thing that I highly recommend, uh, since you guys have, uh, if you, for those of you who have ShareFaith websites, there are some plugins that we recommend out there. Uh, the main one that we recommend for search engine optimization is Yoast. And uh, I believe it actually already comes pre-installed on our users' uh, websites. But if not, you can go into the plugin section on the advanced dashboard and find it. And the Yoast SEO will uh, be a big help in uh, basically allowing you to identify uh, a focus keyword, you can put it in and tell Google and other search engines like, hey, this is what this page should be indexed for. And then it kind of coaches you with information to help you understand like, are you like how you're using the keyword that's going to help, um, how many times it's in there, uh, other things about the article or page that you're working on that will make it uh, serve, that will serve better for the sake of having uh, search engines like it more. So that's a great thing to have available to you. And it does, does other cool things too, like it generates a site map, which uh, search engines need to understand how the flow of your site works. Um, so there's great things that it helps you do kind of behind the scenes uh, that will boost your search engine ranking as well. And then lastly on my list here, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just some things that I, again, these are things that will help you uh, to help you, again, uh, hopefully rank better on search engines. And really, if you are doing these things, you're going to see much better results uh, within a short period of time. So uh, the last thing on my list here is getting link backs. And a link back is essentially any time that you have a reference, like a, somebody linking to your church's website from theirs, that's a link back. Now, not all link backs are equal. In fact, uh, Google is very specific, and they'll look at what they call domain authority. So if you have a link, let's say, from uh, you know, uh, one of the parents who, goes to your, uh, parents who goes to your church's blog, I mean, if she's not like a well-known blogger, or he or she isn't a well-known blogger who um, you know, does a lot of stuff and has a ton of followers, it's probably not going to have a lot of weight behind it. Uh, but let's say you uh, talk to your denomination that you're a part of, or if you're a part of an association of churches, um, or maybe you are uh, partnering with a local ministry that has a lot of uh, a lot of um, people who follow it and, and work with it and stuff. Um, those are good places to get links back to your website from because if they have a lot of visitors and people are following that link, uh, then again, that's going to look better to search engines to say like, hey, like this domain has some authority and it's linking back to these guys. So that gives you some authority as well. Um, so you'll see that a lot where, where people do things. Now, there's, there's definitely things that you shouldn't do uh, when it comes to SEO. And I want to outline a few of those real quick as well. Uh, before we wrap this up and I get to answer some of your guys' questions. So these are what my call, I call the SE no-nos instead of the SEOs. Okay, first of all, don't sound like a robot. Do not go to the lengths of creating keywords and using popular keyword phrases and stuff that you that you remove all organic sense of how that sentence is supposed to be laid out just for the sake of getting a search engine to pick it up. Because one, your readers are going to get annoyed by that. They're going to think something's up. They're going to wonder what's going on with your website. And they're not going to trust the information. And they may not be able to read it and understand what you're talking about. Secondly, uh, search engines are smart. They'll actually catch on to that kind of stuff. When they look at an article and they see like that you've just got these keywords kind of lined one after the other, or you have key terms that really don't fit together, um, they actually have algorithms built into them to kind of look at readability of an article and make sure that it's legitimate. So they'll catch on if something looks like it's just being forced too much, um, or if you just got your article like drenched in keywords, that can be a negative actually. So you want to be careful about how you do that. So when you essentially when you're when you're doing it, just make the article for humans. Don't make it for search engines. Just make your pages for humans, for people to be able to read, and just be mindful of maybe tweaks and different things you can do that could still help search engines to index it higher. Secondly, don't duplicate your content. Uh, by this, I mean like if you see maybe another church that has a very high spot in Google and they've got some stuff that you would say too on your website, uh, then you just copy it over and put it on yours so that way you can try and get a piece of you know, the Google juice there. Sometimes I've heard people call it that the search engines hook onto it. Uh, so don't, don't do that where you're just duplicating things over and over again uh, from others because you'll actually get a negative hit from search engines. If they see that you've copied content 
content because they'll know like where the content was originally placed. They'll have a record of that. So if it shows up later on another website, that's going to look bad and you're actually going to get a ding from them on it. So don't just duplicate content or try to steal it. Um, you might see a topic that's very popular that people are posting on and that's okay to go in and put it in your own words, you know, and uh, you can even still kind of, you know, try and see what kind of key terms people are searching for and still use that even if the others are, but put it in your own words so it's not the same thing. Oops. And then this keeps on disappearing on me. But the last thing, ah, I don't know why it's disappearing. The last thing is not to just make SEO the goal. SEO the goal. And by that, I mean uh, as much as you want your sites to show up on the first page of Google, that's not the goal of the website. The goal of the website is to reach people um, and that can be done through other ways, not just through search engines, uh, but to communicate to them and engage with them and to share Christ with them, to expand the kingdom. Just like any other ministry of your church, a website is a ministry that reaches out to people online and is able to tell them what you're about, give them the opportunity to come meet you in person, and still uh, convey the message of the gospel to them wherever they're at. So again, SEO is not the goal, uh, but really reaching people and engaging with them and ultimately seeing lives transformed for Christ is, just like any other aspect of ministry in your church. So that's the last thing I just want to leave you with uh, before we go ahead, and I'll switch now. I see Chris has been chatting with a lot of people, it uh, looks like, so hopefully uh, we got some good questions here, and I'll take a chance to answer. Give me one sec, and I'll switch back over so you guys can see me. Alright, so hopefully you guys can see me again. I think I got it switched over on the camera correctly. So, is, uh, Chris, go ahead and let me know. What kinds of things are people talking about on, uh, on there? What kinds of questions do we have from folks? Um, so, we have some questions on... Are several YouTube playlists on a page okay? Several YouTube playlists on a page okay? Yeah. It's going to follow the same rules as individual videos on a page. So be mindful of that I wouldn't do, again, I just kind of keep it to two, maybe three, if you're going to do multiple of them. Otherwise, it might be better just to create individual pages for those playlists. I don't know what, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the playlists are each for. Um, typically, you would have a playlist that's maybe for, uh, like one that's just for your sermons in general. Um, maybe if, I, I guess I could see if somebody's creating like channels for series that they want or a playlist for individual series. Um, that might be good then just to kind of like have featured series and then you can always link people back to YouTube to see your other series if you don't want to uh, create separate pages for each one on your own website. But I wouldn't, again, just in general, I wouldn't do more than two or three at a time. Otherwise you're gonna cause too much load problems on your page. I really like that our sermon playlist can, you can add videos to every sermon. So you have an audio so people can mm -hmm, listen to it mm -hmm, video mm -hmm. if they want to they want to play that. So right, and just like Chris is saying, like you can definitely use the built-in sermon player and then put the video links within there so that when somebody clicks on the icon, it can pull up the video right from within there as well. So you have multiple options available to you on how you would choose to display that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see if I have any other questions here. Okay. And again, too, the, you can definitely still chime in if you have questions at this point, if there's anything else coming up. Yeah, any questions, let me know. Okay, <laughs> so it looks like overall, I know we covered a lot of ground, and there's tons of stuff in here, which is why I'm going to make sure tomorrow you'll, he you'll see a follow-up email from me before the end of the day. Uh, that'll just have some more notes and reference points to what I was talking about. So, um, I mean, if we're not seeing anything else, then I don't want to tie you guys up. Uh, give just another few seconds here if anybody else wants to chime in if there's something that they want to discuss at all. But 
other than that, uh, the last thing I'll say too, just before we go, um, so I talked about optimization, and one of the things that we understand is that you may not necessarily see where in your website you can optimize things on how you can do better. Um, our team is actually working on a tool that will be accessible within the Insights tab on Sidekick. Um, that'll be coming out here in the near future, and it will uh, create a chart for you to kind of show you what part of your load times on your website are being, you know, slow it down due to the content that's on your page versus the stuff that's kind of more on the back end and anything else. Um, and we'll kind of give you some examples. It's cool that I've seen some uh, models where it'll show based on the type of internet speed that someone's working with uh, what you might expect to see. So, oh, what we have some else. resolution are share face default backgrounds? Oh, so if somebody's asking about the backgrounds, like if you download a uh, like a PowerPoint background or worship background from ShareFaith. So those are saved. Uh, now the have, there's the SD version, which is about, I want to say like 1100 by 1500, somewhere in there. Uh, it's something like that. It's like a 4 by 3 ratio. And then the HD versions, like the, the other ones are like the 4K backgrounds. Those are 16 by 9 widescreen, um, but those are 4K resolution, which is like 2160 by 3840, something in that, ball, that ballpark. Um, but those are also at 96 DPI, so a little bit higher than web format, like so it's used can be used for projection as well. Um, but if you want to, those are easy to scale down within any basic photo editor um, that you can go through and scale it down to a smaller size if you need to for your purposes too. And those are definitely great to use on websites. Uh huh. Yeah, so somebody's asking about creating an audio playlist. Yes, that's already a feature. If you go to the Share Faith feature section, there's an option. Instead of using a sermon playlist, you can choose a normal audio playlist. And you can upload multiple audio files directly to your site with that. And that's great if you want to do something like we have some groups that are worship bands who have websites or traveling, you know, worship ministries or anything like that. And they want to showcase a few of the, a few of the songs that they perform. Uh, then you can definitely do that with an audio playlist instead. Yeah, or sure. Yeah, like if you have like a page on your site that your team comes to to be able to kind of keep track of what is on the playlist or set list, then you can have like an audio playlist uh, with some rep with some versions of the songs that they can listen to. Um, now, what format and resolution are shape? Oh, you already did that one. Uh huh. <laughs> So with site description, uh, you don't, it's its not as heavy of a need for description. Now, if you're talking about like under the general settings where it gives you the option uh, under the title to put a site description, um, it's not going to hurt you to put a keyword there, uh, but it's not its not overly necessary. Again, like Google doesn't go through and really place um, heavy weight on things outside of the actual content of the page that it's trying to load. The content is going to be your biggest factor in terms of what Google wants to rank you for. So depending on how, how relevant it deems uh, your page to the searches that it's pulling up, uh, like so there's other things outside of your control, unfortunately, but there are things that are outside of your control, like how many visits it actually gets from people who come to it, um, and where it's, again, like link back. So if people are linking to it externally, uh, where that's coming from and how people are using those. Uh, so there are things like that um, that you can kind of influence a little bit by posting stuff on Facebook that comes back to your website or telling your church to go visit a page to learn more, um, giving them direct connection to that. Uh, those things can help fuel that as well. But So your site title and description, while helpful uh, for search purposes, don't necessarily need to be like just geared for search purposes. Again, like anything else, make it for humans. Make it so that people can see it and read it and understand what it is, and then let your content do the talking uh, to both them and have some stuff there that search engines can pick up on as well. Okay, no, so, um, somebody asked if they get most of their graphics from ShareFaith, whether the mm -hmm. size needed automatically for the website. I think you already covered that. In some 
Yeah, kind of talking with it. I mean, we have what I would recommend is looking at the actual website banner section. The website banners, um, our older ones are a little bit smaller. They're like 950 by 323 size, mm -hmm. and that's kind of designed for the templates we have that use the scrolling homepage banner on the front. Um, but lately, we've also been making them in larger sizes so they can be used for full width purposes on any template. Um, so they're 1920. Uh, wide, and I don't remember the exact dimensions tall. Uh, but so the website graphics are, is it 636? Okay, so those ones then I would recommend looking into uh, first for your website graphics. And then for background purposes, you could definitely use the files that we provide. You might just want to consider scaling it down a little bit more to a 1080p resolution instead of the 4K backgrounds. So, but you're welcome to use them for sure. And uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, if you if you you know jump into a basic editor to scale it down, you can even actually do that in the website's media library. There's a simple editor to let you crop and scale within there that you can learn how to use. So, and Chris has done tutorials on how to do simple things like that. Oh, yeah. So there's tutorials that cover how to do things with editing images and so forth. So there's lots of ways you can find out more on how to do that. Um, uh, all that brings me to the other question that we have. What about the, somebody asked a question about the um, backgrounds that are included, included with the website, you know, where they can, they can mm -hmm. background and just click the mountain button and, and, and then they have a choice to choose the background. Those aren't actually SharePoint backgrounds, they're from another those are yeah those are like actually hosted on the website servers for when you're changing your templates and things like that um, and those are just kind of meant as like a default dummy background if you will some people still use them if they don't necessarily have anything on them that would be contrary to what they're trying to convey over the top of the background like the whatever message they're putting on it so you're welcome to do that still um, but yeah for those they're mostly just kind of like placeholders if you will uh, that then you can simply go in and put your own background over instead of. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with using those. Um, a lot of them are, not all of them, but a lot of them uh, are sometimes grabbed from designs that we have on ShareFaith and made with some modifications to kind of look more like a, you know, for a website purpose. So yeah, it's totally up to you what you, uh, what you want to do with that. But those aren't, like you won't see the exact same backgrounds all the time on ShareFaith.com because we've usually taken a different image or taken one of those designs and changed already. So <laughs> Sorry, somebody asked a question and I think I need to ask them. Okay. Well, I think right now we're coming kind of towards the end of our time. So if there are any other questions, then what we'll do is we'll actually follow up with you guys. Uh, if it's not quite noon yet, I don't know. I don't have the time, but... Uh, We'll, we'll stay on for a little bit just to make sure we, we uh, reach back to everyone. And then, again, you guys will hear from me tomorrow. I'll send you an email follow-up, uh, again, with just some more notes on a little bit more detail on some of the things we talked about. So if you guys weren't able to catch all of that, you'll still get it. And we'll have a replay for the webinar available that you guys can access for a while as well. So ever and ever. Forever and ever. I don't know, maybe. We'll see. But we'll have a replay available that you guys can check out. So if you missed any part of this, came in late or anything, you'll be able to uh, check that out again. Or if you're well, you feel more than welcome to share this with other people too, if there's anybody else who you think could uh, benefit from the stuff that we talked about today. So, all right. Uh, well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and close us in prayer. And uh, thank you guys again so much for coming. Uh, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you guys and just share some of the stuff. I really hope that this has been some good beneficial information for you, giving you a lot of food for thought on what you can do to optimize your websites already. And I'll pray for us. So, Father God, I thank you for this time. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity that all of us have here uh, who are uh, working with websites for our churches, working with any communication platform for our churches, that we get to uh, do these things to put our best foot forward. And uh, again, Lord, we know the goal is not just about having like the most cool website or getting the first page on Google necessarily, but really, Lord, ultimately anything we can do to reach more for your kingdom, that's what it's about. So God, I ask that you just keep that perspective in our hearts and minds as we go about our tasks and the work involved with our ministries and elsewhere. And I thank you, Lord, and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thank you guys again so much. Always a pleasure. Uh, I will be in touch with you soon. And in the meantime, you guys have a great day. God bless.